Hello everyone. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Andrew and today I'll be presenting my research proposal on the verification of treatment plans for stereotactic body radiotherapy of the lung. Before I get started, I just want to quickly thank my supervisors Pedgman and Rashid. Even though they're really busy, they still find time to give me advice and support, which I really appreciate. And I look forward to uh, working alongside them on this project. So starting off with the principal aim. And this is to assist in the clinical implementation of stereotactic body radiotherapy or SBRT for the treatment of lung cancers at Sir Charles Gardner Hospital. I intend to achieve this through two different avenues. First of all, through an investigation into the most suitable beam energy to use for lung SBRT treatments. Now this was done through a literature review assessing the dose delivery of 6X FFF or flattening filter free beams versus 10X with flattening filter beams. And I've finished this. Secondly, through creating advanced lung phantoms using 3D printing to deliver and compare various different treatment planning methods. Now I'll get into the detail of these two aims later in the presentation, but first of all, I want to go over some of the background information that's relative to this project. So starting off with lung cancer, a large part of the significance of this project lies in the fact that lung cancer has such high incidence and mortality rates. In 2020, data was pulled across both sexes, 36 different cancer sites and 185 countries. And it found lung cancer to have the second highest incidence rate and the highest mortality rate of all cancers. Around 85% of lung cancer cases are non-small cell lung cancers and around one fifth of those present at an early stage. Now the standard treatment of care for early stage non-small cell lung cancers is surgery either through a lobectomy, a bilobectomy, or a pneumonectomy. This results in five-year survival rates of around 60 to 70 percent. Some patients are deemed medically inoperable for surgery, and this can be due to comorbidities like decreased lung function or a refusal of surgery. Now for these patients, they were conventionally or they were historically treated with a conventional radiotherapy. However, inadequate treatment outcomes led to dose escalation studies this ultimately culminated in the adoption of SBRT as the standard of care for medically inoperable patients. Now, before I get into SBRT and what it is, I want to go over some of its history and background. So it has its roots in a much older treatment, which is cranial stereotactic radiosurgery. This was a treatment that was developed in the 1950s, and it saw success by delivering ablative doses of highly conformal external beams to a target during a single fraction. So this is to a target within the cranium. The term stereotactic refers to the fixation frame that is used to immobilize the patient and allow for accurate positioning. So as can be seen in this figure uh, at the bottom on the right here, this is the original frame that was used in st stereotactic radiosurgery. It was bolted into the skull of the patient to keep them immobilized and allow for patient uh, setup. Nowadays, a less invasive method method is used with a thermoplastic mask, which can be seen on the left. Now for stereotactic body radiotherapy, it was developed in the mid 1990s at the Karolinska Hospital in Sweden. And initially it was defined by uh, a similar, in a similar way to radiosurgery. So this is by the delivery of a conformal dose distribution to extracranial targets using a hyperfractionated treatment schedule and a stereotactic frame for patient setup and accuracy. Now the frame that was used in SBRT wasn't bolted into the patient like uh, in radiosurgery, thankfully enough. This is a picture of that original frame that was developed in the 90s at the Karolinska Institute. And its purpose was twofold. So first of all, to immobilize the patient, there are these vacuum cushions within the frame that suck to the patient and keep them still during treatment. And second of all, it was used uh, as an external coordinate system for the tumor localization within the patient. So if you can see uh, on, the, on the frame, there's this graduated system. Uh, as you can see, I'm highlighting with my cursor. And what happened is the patient would have their CT scan in this frame. That system would be uh, able to be seen in the CT scan. So when it was time for the patient to be treated, they would be positioned relative to the tumor's position on that external coordinate system and the LINAC ISO center. So this isn't used nowadays. And that's thanks to the advent of in-room imaging. And so for Linux, in-room imaging is basically the mounted KV source and imager that is used for cone beam CTs. And here's a picture of a Linux. On the left, you can see the KV source. That's just a source of X-rays in the kilovoltage range. And 
uh, opposite that is the detector for those x-rays. And this is mounted at 90 degrees to the main treatment beam. And so this is rotated around the patient 360 degrees and a cone beam CT uh, is formed. So 3D volumetric data is reconstructed from these 2D projections. And this cone beam CT is compa compared to a reference CT using image registration algorithms to determine if the patient is set up properly and if not, they're adjusted. And so this is one of the reasons it's also called SABER or selective ablative radiotherapy. And that's because the stereotactic frame is no longer used. So if the stereotactic frame is no longer used and this old definition is now ob obsolete, how is SBRT now defined? Well, different institutions across various countries have all given their own definitions of SBRT. Here's an example of some of those institutions. And instead of going over the individual definitions, uh, I just want to talk about some of the points that they all agree on. And so that's SBRT is a method of external beam radiotherapy that accurately delivers high dose of radiation in few treatment fractions to an extracranial target. Now I want to go over each of these points individually to really understand what SBRT is and what I'll be doing in this project. So first of all, it's a method of external beam radiotherapy. This means that it's a treatment beam that originates from outside of the body compared to something like uh, brachytherapy where the radiation source is inside the body and it's not machine or radiation type specific so it can be done on linux with image guidance technology or specifically adapted machines like a cyber knife as well as with particles or with photons and so in this project we'll be using linux therefore we'll be using uh, photons the second part of the definition it must be accurately delivered of course this is true for all different treatment techniques but it's especially relevant in SBRT because of the high doses per fraction. Now it must be accurately delivered across all areas of the treatment process. So this is disease staging, target and organs at risk delineation and intrafraction motion management. Lastly, it must have a highly conformed beam to the tumor. So the third part of the definition, high doses of radiation. So what do we mean by high? High dose is of course a relative term but generally what is meant is high compared to conventional radiotherapy doses. So anything over two to three grays per fraction, but typically you'd be looking at around 15 to 18 grays per fraction. Now it's not a one size fits all approach. It's dependent on the tumor location, the tumor size and other patient factors. So for example, if the tumor is located centrally, the dose per fraction may be lowered due to the risk of uh, overdosing the trachea. But in general, biological effective doses of around or over 100 gray are recommended. So then fourth, it's delivered in a few fractions. And of course, this is also relative, but this means usually less than 10 fractions. It's a combined consideration with the dose per fraction, and it's not const constant across different institutes and patients. So lastly, it's to an extracranial target. So that just means anywhere outside of the cranium. If it's within the cranium, so to the brain, that's dealt with by uh, radiosurgery. So now we have a good understanding of SBRT and what it is. I want to go over 4D CT or respiration correlated CT. This is really important in SBRT and it's also uh, important in my project. So 4D CTs are possible due to uh, the ability of modern CT scanners to take a full 360 degree scan within a fraction of the patient's respiratory cycle. So if you look at the figure down here on the bottom right, you can see that scans are taken at different phases of the cycle, of the breathing cycle. So you can see one here, end expiration, end inspiration, and so on. So these scans are binned into these different phases and a, a, a movie or a, a, a video can be constructed that you can see in the top right here. And then, so this has numerous different uh, uses for lung SBRT. Starting off, you can create uh, custom ITV margins specific to the patient's respiratory motion. So different patients will uh, breathe at different amplitudes. Therefore, the ITV margins that are added onto the tumor to account for things like uh, organ motion and, and, and the tumor motion can be done custom to the patient's breathing patterns. And also you can reduce blurring and averaging motion artifacts that are seen in regular 3D CTs. So this is from the movement of the tumor and the lung throughout a static image of the patient. 
And so this allows for more accurate contouring. And then lastly, it can be used for motion management strategies during treatment, such as things like gating and tracking. So here's a picture of a quasar motion phantom we have at the hospital. And I'll be using 4D CT data in this. Here's another picture from a manufacturer. And what happens is the 4D CT data or the respiratory data is loaded into this phantom and different components move, trying to replicate the, pa the patient's lung and chest wall during treatment. So first of all, starting off with the chest wall platform, this is meant to simulate the patient's uh, chest wall breathing during treatment. The more important part here is this moving insert. So this moving insert goes back and forth in this direction, and it's meant to represent the patient's lung. So going to a bit more detail with that, you can see it splits in half. This ball here is representing the tumor, which also splits in half. And the reason for this is so you can put a layer of film in the middle and assess the dose delivery at the end of a treatment. This is a screenshot of uh, respiratory cycle data in the program that can be modified. This is not a uh, real respiratory data. You can create your own custom ones for things like quality assurance. And it's used to drive that movable insert that I showed and the chest wall platform. So you might be thinking, why don't we just use this quasar motion phantom as is? You remember at the start of the presentation, I said I'd be using 3D printing to make our own phantoms. And the reason for that is the movement of the film in this phantom with the tumor causes the dose distribution to smear. So what we want is the film to stay still as the tumor and the lung move alongside it. And so that doesn't happen in this phantom. Therefore, I'm going to be using 3D printing to make a custom insert uh, the custom lung structure, as well as a holder for the film so it stays still during that motion. So now I'll give a brief, very, very brief overview of 3D printing. If you'd like to learn a little bit more about that, I did a workshop with a colleague, Riley, and that's available on the UWA Medical Physics YouTube channel. So starting off, you have a virtual object, and that's either by modeling it yourself in a program like Fusion 360, or uh, scanning it in with a laser if you have the object in real life. Then this is sliced into G-code in a slicing program, something like Prusa Slicer. And essentially what G-code is, is just instructions for the printer to know where to move to, how much filament to extrude and so on. So this is loaded into your 3D printer. And the ones we have here at the hospital are fused deposition modeling printers. So what that means is it uses a thermoplastic filament, it heats it up to its melting point and then lays it down layer by layer to uh, achieve the final product. And so finally, the research plan. So putting everything together from the background, uh, just first a quick reminder of the principal aim of the project. This is to assist in the clinical implementation of SBRT for the treatment of lung cancers here at Sir Charles Gardner Hospital. So this is to be done through first an investigation of the best beam energy to use. And I said I finished this through my uh, literature review. I found six XFFF beams to uh, be, have the best dose delivery. They had the lowest dose to organs at risk, the highest conformality. Even though the literature is somewhat scarce and speculative, that's the best beam energy that I found. Secondly, through creation of the advanced lung phantom. So this was through the 3D printing process, making that uh, custom lung insert and having the film uh, stay stationary as the lung insert moves alongside it. This has two stages, a design stage, which is just modeling the components up on Autodesk Fusion 360, as well as uh, taking the lung structure from DICOM files and converting them to 3D objects and so on. It also has important design questions like which filament should I use? How am I going to keep the film stationary? What kind of holder will I have to model up? And also is 3D printing that lung structure actually feasible? So the lung structure is incredibly complex and might not actually be possible for the 3D printers to uh, produce that structure, but I'll have to investigate that. So then the construction stage is essentially just printing out the components and then assembling them together with the lung insert and film holder. So then finally, the third part of the research plan is to deliver these treatment plans once they're made by the treatment planners to the phantom and compare their dose distributions using gamma map analysis. And so from there, we'll choose the plans that show the best agreements. Thank you for listening.